Hello, hello, what ho! Welcome back to another exciting adventure of Red Hen Radio. It has been, as we all say in the biz, a hot <laughs> like minute. No, yeah. not even that. It's been a hot like two years. Like yeah. when was the last time we talked, Daniel? Um yeah, it it has been almost two years, has it? It's been crazy. It's crazy. It's been crazy. But you know what? Every once in a while when I can, like today when you went live, I jumped in and out with my one channel that I'm on primarily, and then I went to Red Hand Radio and said hello. I put you on both channels. I went to my community page and uh, and shared. Thank you so much, man. I really appreciate that. Yeah, so okay, so let's jump right into that and say how you felt about today's um premiere. Uh, I was shocked. There were like 20 people in there. That, that was amazing. Like, uh, it, which I is what? Really... Which is what? Hold on. Now that's like four times as much as was in your live show, right? <laughs> um, no, which one? I remember one of your live shows. I think you said there was like five people there. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, so we yeah, got, it's, we got it's, four times as much. Yeah, it's grown. A, it's grown a lot. Um, <laughs> I just I, I didn't promote it like at all, and uh, the premiere did way better than I thought it would. There were a bunch of people in the in the chat, and it was fun talking to them. And some of them were like asking questions and stuff, and it was uh, very, um, I guess, validating or gratifying to see so many people engaging with something that I've, you know, put a lot of time and effort into, and that I'm really proud of. So it was, it was just it was really cool. And uh, thanks for joining, by the way. Those was... I, I could only join for a little bit, but I did when I could. So it was right, actually right at the end. I'm I'm a truck driver for um, anyone who who isn't aware, and so I was actually right at the end of my shift. So I was coming oh, wow. in. I was coming into the to the uh, yard to park the truck at the end of the day, and you just came on live, and so I jumped in there, and both channels flip flop back and forth, jumped into one, jumped into the other, said hello, said hello blah 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 but uh yeah you know what's funny is i on today's route i listened to your entire uh album again holy and crap so, man well you know, that's, awesome. you know yeah, that's that's what i do when i drive I, I listen to stuff that keeps me occupied while i'm i'm on the road and um yeah so okay let's see the, where do i want to go from here um so let's go back to your uh latest live show right yes right yeah so you talked a little bit about or you mentioned a little bit of the the um excitement of having someone out in the crowd singing along with you sure sure yeah that's a great way to put right? it right it was yeah yeah and uh that was a cover song am i right yes um that was uh which one was it uh, phoebe bridgers i think i know the end yeah it was it was amazing it was surreal actually it was uh that was my first like okay so up until this point i've played a festival i might have actually played two festivals i've played um backup for my friend hunter uh, a couple of times yeah. at some bars and a couple venues and then i've played some shorter shows uh, most of which were like you know, unpaid and just for the experience and exposure and whatnot. Um, this this gig that I just did was the first paid gig, and it was four hours long. Um, and I played That's like seventy songs. <laughs> it was uh, yeah. It was. And you didn't you didn't break. I did not. I was supposed to. I was supposed to take at least one break, but I, I, I was now, just was in the zone. Now, was that just simply to give you an opportunity to rest your vocal cords and drink some water? Yeah. Or, yeah. And you're I like, so. you're like, I'm good. Yeah. I mean, they, they didn't, they, they told me beforehand that I could, you know, stop. Um, and my friend Hunter has played the venue multiple times before, and he normally takes like a couple breaks, uh, I think one every hour. Um, but I don't know. I was just very excited. Yeah, you were you were trooping yeah. through. Yeah, it was it was fun. It was You're really like, fun. Okay, so so here's the thing now. For the next for for every other show after this, you can't take a break again because otherwise <laughs> you're going to go backwards. Exactly. Exactly. Sure. You got to and and now you can't just do four. You've got to do four and a quarter, four and a half, five. You just got to keep. You've actually signed yourself over to a death sentence. That's exciting. Four more hours. That's, That's what people Let's are going to be it. saying. They're going to be saying four more hours. 
I hope. Let's hope so. <laughs> you know? Yeah. You know? Maybe, yeah. maybe in uh, 10 years, I'll, I'll be like, oh, not another four hours. But um, <laughs> right now, four more hours sounds like, uh, Nirvana. Sounds like a dream. Let's sounds do like it. Nirvana. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Yeah, that's awesome. So let's let's just stay right there in the in terms of that venue. What are some other things in that venue that st that stand out for you? Um, let's see. Well, one thing that stood out is that they invited me back multiple times. I'm I'm uh I'm really excited about this. That's fantastic. Opportunity. Yeah, yeah. It's super cool. The venue's awesome. Um, it was a it was a winery, uh, that's like two and a half hours away from us, uh, up in like the mountains. <laughs> um. And uh, there was a cool, like, there were a lot of different types of people there, you know? Like, there were older people, younger people. So, like, I play cover songs of older music and newer music. So it was, it was, uh, it worked well, and I was able to, like, get, give something to, to everybody, something that they knew, hopefully. Right. That's awesome. So, um, one thing that, like, for me, I, I was given a guitar in my freshman year of college, and uh, I never, ever, 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 in my opinion, got good. I could, I could learn a song. Okay. But I don't think for me, I have the the muse. Like for me, like if I, if I were talking to somebody and they were like, yeah, man, I play guitar, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, yeah, I, I know how to play They're Like, oh, you should come over and jam with us. I'm like, uh, no, <laughs> you don't want, like, I could never riff. Sure. I could never like speak the language of music. So um, for you, it seems that mm. though you have that antenna, you have that tune where you're able to speak the language of music. Because if, if anyone, okay, so let's see, you're the only engineer of your album? Yes, so the the last two. The first one yeah. I had a little bit of help on a couple tracks, okay, that's but fine. the last two. Sure, yeah. that's fine. Yeah. But, but let's say just this last album, you engineered yes. everything. Yeah, so to me, you've got the muse. You've got the ability to hear. You've got the ability to think. It's like, you know, someone says, uh, it's one thing to learn German. But when you dream in German, then you know the language. Okay. Mm. I, I will I will say that I, I believe that um, the, the antenna or the, the muse or the... Um, the ability to kind of know what you're looking for or be able to make stuff up or jam or, or whatever uh, is something that I had, I definitely had to cultivate it. It was not like, I, I don't feel that it was innately there. It, uh, it like grew from uh, listening to music all the time and just practicing and experimenting all the time to until you get to a point where um, some stuff is just familiar to you to the point where you can just kind of do it, you know? And I'm still really not that, like I, I can play a lot of basic uh, chords on guitar and I think in the engineer wise, like I know what I want when I'm making a song so I, I can layer stuff to make it sound almost more complex than it actually is. But um, I'm still would consider myself a lower level intermediate guitar player. I'm still learning a lot, but uh it's in, it's fun. It's like I I would encourage like anybody to try to play an instrument. Like oh yeah, sure. It's it's hard, but it's fun. Yeah, um, once no doubt, get, no doubt, yeah. for, for sure. I so for me, I I think I'd like to say that I'm not equipped, although I will say I'm absolutely lazy. <laughs> so well, I am too. So. so well, yeah, but see, well, but see, I think that you're equipped. Mm. So for me, mm. I practiced. I would practice a song and uh, learn a song. I would look at the chords, practice the chords. You know, no crazy, like, I hate bar chords. Bar chords to me, like, I'm just like, how in the hell yeah, they, they does suck. anyone do that? Like, the finger strength for that. Anyway, um, but uh, so for me, 
I would think that I'm 80% lazy and 20% equipped. Mm. And um, I, I can't remember the last time I picked up a guitar. Uh, I, I left my guitar with my mother, said, give it to my nephews. They play. If they want to use it, they can play it. But um, So oh, with, nice. with your... <laughs> Uh, with your album, let I want to say that today when I was listening, at least for the first two or three, I don't remember a drum, a drum fill, and then I remember picking up on the drum fill afterwards. So, how much of your engineering is synthesized, and how much of it is you playing the phys physical instrument? Um, any, anytime you hear drums, it's synthesized. Like I, I'll, I'll play it like on a keyboard, you know, like there's, you, you can program the different, yep. um, sounds into different notes. And then if you hit it harder, it plays it louder. Or if you play it really softly, then it's like a, a muted, you know, as if you had like, uh, uh, what, what do they, what do you have on drums? I recently actually got to, had the privilege of playing drums for like the first time, uh, at, at the... Uh, at Diamond Studios, and that was really interesting and fun. Um, but anyway, uh, so yeah, the drums are synthesized. Um, let's see, the guitar obviously is not. The vocals aren't. The the bass isn't. Most of the piano is, you know, keyboard. I think on, um, on the second. Are we talking about just the last record, or? Yeah, because that was the one that I listened to today. So I, okay. as I was listening. I felt like the first, and I'll just say the first two, I felt okay. like was just acoustic. And then, uh, at least in the third or fourth song, I remember then hearing other instrumentation. Okay. And so then I was wondering, oh, I wonder if then, if he's messing around with physical instruments or if he's just manufacturing this. I don't care. It doesn't matter to me because the one song that I was listening to that had a drum fill and a hi-hat fill, I could hear the hi-hat. And I was like, man, that would be, that's really interesting if he's, you know, obviously synthesizers have been around for, you know, 60 years. But um, that was just a question that I had is whether or not sure. how much of the track was physical and how much of it, I, again, it's not a criticism. It's just a sure, curiosity. Sure. Um, yeah, I totally understand. Um, uh, hmm. I'm... I wish I knew which track you were referring to, and then I could give you more information about like the the actual process of creating it. Because like, um, I know that like on the older stuff that I made, I've used like um, a drum preset thing, and then like messed with it a lot to make it like unique or whatever. But there was still like a a bass thing there before I started messing with it. But here on the newest album, most of it is um, unique, like completely unique and built from the ground up or whatever. But uh, yeah, there's also, it's very subtle, but there are actually drums on the second the second track on okay. Lightning in a Bottle. I might it's, have missed it's, it. Okay. It's like, it's just at the beginning, really. It, it was originally, there was a lot more emphasis on them. Uh, and my mom listened to the song and she said that it was... Um, it sounded like too poppy and the drums were like overpowering everything else so i like listened back to it and decided she's kind of right it, it does sound better being more acoustic it sounds more warm and it works better for like the feel i was trying to go for so i just turned the drums way down and then put like a filter on them to make them um to, and, and I, I like eq'd them so that they were like far apart uh in the the actual headspace if you have headphones on or surround sound or whatever mm -hmm. and uh yeah i think it worked it worked well but yeah do, it's very, super do, um, do you geek out on those technicalities of trying to uh manipulate the stereo um i and i i enjoy experimenting uh, i don't know if i'd call it geeking out because i don't know like the right terms for any of it and I, half the time i have no idea what i'm doing i just know what i'm looking for and so i'll sit there for could be hours you know of trying to get the get whatever it is to sound right or to do whatever it is i'm trying to get it to do i do i do like stereo sound is very cool to me or surround sound or the ability to like have something like on make a right there's like 
one guitar playing chords in yeah. one side and yeah. then there's another guitar playing like little melodies or little yeah. riffs yep. in the other side and uh, doing stuff that's like that. That's what I'm talking fun. about. That's what I'm talking about in terms of having the muse. Uh, mm. if, if you can think on that level, if you can get into that space of being able to think in that language, I, I think that that makes you a muse, a musician. Um, that I, I don't have that. Like I could never, I don't think that I could ever practice guitar enough that I could actually just absolutely just riff mm. and improvise. I don't think I could. I don't know if that's because somebody would say, well, if you practice enough, Travis, you know, if you put enough work in, Travis, you know, it's like, <laughs> I could never be a professional whatever. Like, no, you could, you just haven't put the work in that might be a fair enough criticism but at the same time at the same time i think that there actually is a gene a genetic disposition for some people to just that's just their world hmm. i you don't know? know but may, maybe i don't know. i think I, I think that you do have a a um a proclivity i think that you do have the ability to speak that language well, based on what you put out right i mean like look. yeah i guess yeah. I'll, i guess i'll just say thank you for you know sure i i, I greatly appreciate that yeah um hmm. it's interesting it is it is interesting to you know to have grown an ear for that i guess and to make it to a point where um you're you can put stuff together and kind of know what it is that you're looking for and what you're trying to do. I will say that I think the ability to do that, the specific thing we were just talking about, the layering of different sounds or the playing notes within the chord on one side and the other or whatever, um, came a lot from listening to music in like other people's music where I was actively listening for the layering and then I would try, and then I would go on to my editing software and try to like figure out what they were doing or copy what they were doing in some way. This was before I started making my own music. This was back when I first got the software and was still figuring it out. There was like a year of time where I was just making nonsense uh, before I ever tried to put together Mania Machinations and then everything that came after that. I actually made like three albums of music uh that will never see the light of day and that that <laughs> sucked so yeah. bad <laughs> well, why okay so why won't they um well one of the biggest issues with them was uh vocals i i didn't know how to sing at all like it's so it's it's like painful and not in the same way that like like when i listen to daniel johnston or or hobo johnston and the love makers and their vocals are like very unique and maybe not like the most perfect you could possibly imagine or whatever or even somebody like bob dylan even you know they yeah um there's a lot of like emotional potency in what they're doing there's there's a lot of lyrical um a genius really being uh shown there's a lot of other things to focus on with my old stuff the lyrics were cringy and the vocals were so incredibly off key that if i go back and listen i really can't go back and listen to it it's so bad um and uh some of the musical compositions i go back and listen to and think they're kind of cool but then a lot of other ones are super simple and just i don't know like feel like i, I just don't really like any of it there, there's one or two that i might go back and steal from in the future um and there actually was at least two songs that I have repurposed on albums. Um, one of those being on the very first album I ever released, Mania Machinations, there was a song called, uh, uh, what was it called? Ye Yellow Blurry Wallpaper. That was a messed up song. Yeah. Um, super, super emotionally potent song. Um, and that's the only old recording that will ever make it onto an album. That was actually recorded almost a year before that album was put together and i just kind of i i re-listened to it and was like this works and this needs to be on something so i kind of threw it on okay there. so how did you decide that, that 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 worked 
how did you decide that that is going to move forward for you? Um, the content, the lyrical content and the, um, the vocals while still being really bad for that song in particular, they felt like, um, they almost served the song. They served the, the purpose that I was trying to use, use for them. Um, and so in that case, I would say that whatever I was trying to accomplish back when I was 15 or whatever worked and I was able to, um, do whatever it was I was trying to do. Another issue with my older stuff is the recording quality is really, really bad. Like I didn't have this microphone. I didn't have any real equipment. I was, I, rem I remember I was making some stuff in audacity before I, um, was able, I, I like saved up for a few months to be able to get um, FL Studio, which is the software I currently use. Um, but uh, yeah, Audacity is a free uh, editing or audio editing software. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, for this song though, the, the low fidelity quality of it almost added charm to it, where on other songs it made it abrasive and almost unlistenable. For, for this one, I remember I put some like uh, thunder in the background, like I recorded it raining outside and put them with the the song and it like added ambience to it and warmth to it. And it, uh, uh, yeah, the whole thing ended up coming together really well. But um, aside from that, I've, I've been rambling for this. On no, this no, particular. not at all. Aside, no, no. Aside from it's that, not rambling. The, um, we're, we're, we're hanging on every word. The, uh, the first... I guess three, yeah, three albums that I made are hot garbage. But I did learn a lot. I learned a <laughs> ton. Like um, that, I would not have been able to do something like Mania Machinations if it wasn't for those records. I also don't think I ever would have been able to release music at all if it wasn't for artists like, uh, let's see, I mentioned Hobo Johnson already. Um, who else? Oh yeah, Car Seat Headrest. Um, there's a few artists that do this thing where they will release demos of their stuff or they don't care if it sounds like it's low fidelity. It's almost like this garage rock or very super indie rock type of thing. And that sort of fearlessness in being able to be ambitious without worrying about, you know, without worrying too much about, um, do I have enough money to do this? You know, do I have equipment to do this? Do I have the ability to do on the first album, I actually recorded some of the drum sounds by like hitting pots, you know, like you gotta be creative and creativity works within art, you know, and yeah, makes sure. it, makes it more interesting. And so bands that have the, or groups or artists that have the courage to do stuff like that and really not care what people think and just keep, uh, growing and, saying what they want to say and not giving a damn uh that's that was very inspirational to me and definitely helped with getting over anxiety towards publishing my own stuff um and uh also taught me a lot about you know how to how to make something that's low fidelity or low quality sound listenable still or interesting still you know uh, anyways <laughs> so how how do you interact with the, the comments that you see, positive, negative, constructive, deconstructive? Um, let's start there. But then also, uh, have you had any criticism from, I suppose, what would be considered um, someone who's in the business? someone who's in the field so to speak rather than just simply someone like me who would say oh you sound like wah, 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 just a keyboard warrior wah, you, know. <laughs> you know so so on the one hand uh, tell, tell us how you respond to and appreciate or or evaluate just comments from keyboard warriors and then follow up with have you been able to find in the comments or someone who shared it with someone who knew someone who said hey check this guy out if you've had anybody come in and say hey 
you've got something good. Mm, have you thought about this? Hmm. Um, let's see. Let me. I'll. I'll start at the. I'll start with the first question. Um. The. Uh, for comments. Uh. The the comments are a weird. Uh, engaging with feedback on my stuff is a very weird beast to to tangle with because on one hand I want to I'm I'm a kind of a person that like can go to extremes kind of and like stay in extremes and has trouble finding balance or a middle ground which is something I'm constantly trying to work on but um on one hand I want to really really engage with everything people say about my stuff you know it means the world to me that someone's engaging with something that i put you know time and effort into and a lot of times there's some level of ego involved too where it's like i'm writing about myself or things that have happened to me or like life events or whatever in a lot of these songs and other people are relating to it or engaging with it and i feel like i'm my whatever is being validated or understood on some level and it's like yay you know so i want to interact with everything but at the same time i could read 10 positive comments and then one negative comment and the one negative comment stays with me for like a week you know like sometimes i'm afraid to look at the um feedback that something gets uh and it is interesting to see how people engage with it um since i've been online i have learned a lot about how people interact online because there's there's no there's very little filter uh, obviously like platforms themselves have filters like they they'll censor things or remove comments or whatever but people or a lot of people um don't have a filter because most most people who comment or engage with stuff are not putting their real name out there they're not like putting they're they're anonymous you know when you're anonymous you can do or say um whatever you want so uh when i first started making videos on youtube i didn't i was very naive and did not really understand how to just take things with a grain of salt and not let things affect me and it kind of over time has uh I've developed thicker skin, if you will. Um, but also over time, like the people who support my stuff has grown a lot. Like when I first was doing this, there were like on, on, that, on that channel, when I was making role-playing game content, there were like three dedicated haters <laughs> uh, who were wasting ridiculous amounts of time hating on my stuff. Uh, and then there were like three or four people who would like watch two minutes of a video and then be like, oh, it's kind of cool, and then move on. Um, where now, if I upload a song, there's there's four or five people who seem to comment under every thing that I do, and whether it's a positive or a negative thing, I like appreciate them and like almost feel like while well, I don't know them yet, and they're not really like, I guess some of them are friends at this point, but um, you know, I don't know them in real life. I still feel. Um, very connected with the community that's grown around this stuff. Uh, and the fact that there is a sense of community is one of the greatest, it gives me one of the greatest senses of, it, of achievement ever. Like, it's so surreal that there's a community around this nonsense that I'm throwing out into the void on YouTube as a teenager with a, with a, camera and a microphone um but then i guess with negative stuff like i was saying used to be uh more difficult for me to handle it now now it's kind how of do just you how whatever. do you um wade through positive negative and negative negative like how do you as how do you evaluate someone's comment as completely just not worth considering because it's doubly negative it, it's coming from an, a, a place where there's really no positive construction and then oh, yeah. someone who comes along and says maybe you should you know yeah po there's positive and negative um it's interesting back when i was that's 
that's a great point actually back when i was first starting negative negative would have greatly affected me now that's what i barely notice at all and that that doesn't matter um but now when someone like uh comments and they're positive in one sense and then negative in another sense that's that's more real you know because that person's being dead serious and that person's coming from a place where they want to engage with your work and on one hand you want to be like it's art i can do whatever i want in art or whatever on another on the other hand you got to be like you know well you do have to be able to in order to grow you have to be able to evaluate stuff you know and if um uh a bunch of people are saying something similar maybe you should take steps to correct whatever it is that they are that they were uh talking about um i actually appreciate constructive criticism a lot sure more than i oh used yeah to. well look like, so there's there's constructive there's deconstructive and then and then there's destructive ah uh, right? that's that's so so you've got someone who's going to say something that's that's a positive criticism there's somebody who's going to who's going to break down what you've done in a way to bring it about to have construction they, they want you to rebuild and then there's mm. a person that has none of that in in, yeah. in their mind at all they just want to tear I'm just down a, it I'm just a everything. wrecking ball yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. um deconstruction is really fun that might be one of my favorite type of things in the world because i love doing that in real life like sure. not necessarily for the purpose of criticism but just analysis and deconstruction of media in general is one of my i, I love that i love other people who do that you know i love i watch video essays about movies that i love all the time going into like the the themes and the the metaphors and what the what everyone was intending with it and what the hidden things that you didn't notice um same with music same with books same with pretty much any form of media and uh, i love engaging with media on that level where you're analyzing it to the point where you can get the most value that you can as a person out of it you know and, and understand it on as deep a level as you really can without being its creator you know um and then when I see some comment that's like three or four paragraphs long of someone deconstructing or analyzing the lyrics and the musical structure of a song that I make, it's like it's come full circle and it's really, it's really special and cool and so, crazy. Okay, so what I did this, this, when you released your album and I listened to it for the first time, I made a comment that something in... You may ask yourself... Still here. Reminiscent of the Talking Heads. Oh no! It, it was that was very very intentional. Okay. Yes. Okay. So yes. You, okay. Now, did anybody else make that comment? Because as soon as it happened, I stopped your track, and I think I put the timestamp in and went, "This is completely <laughs> like there's no way this yeah. can't be a nod, right? You're 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 tipping your hat. It was it was almost past a nod. I I wouldn't call it like it's. The, the tra that track, what's the name of that track? It's called uh, 2031, Another Odyssey, something like that. Yeah, anyway, yeah, okay. Odyssey. You're right, right. Yeah, it's Odyssey. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, a few, there were probably five or six other people that have commented or reached out to me to ask me if that song had anything to do with, the, with Once in a Lifetime. And yes, it's like the very first line of the song is, you, you may find yourself, yeah, yeah. you know, yeah, and yeah, then yeah. only... Only this is like super depressing and messed up, and it's like a post-apocalyptic and almost like a, a cult thing. Like they're creating a cult where one one body, one mind thing, you know. Um, but uh, yeah, the the actual lyrics were um, multiple times very almost a ripoff. You know, I, I wouldn't call it that. You know, because that I uh, it, it is intended to be a reference, but. Um, yeah, uh, I really like that song. I, I actually didn't expect people to like that one, but so far I've had yeah. multiple people no, tell me I that's think their that was favorite the, song. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Album. Not that the other ones weren't um, enjoyable. That one, for me, I think that that one was the step up. Even even before it got to that lyric. That's awesome. Yeah. That's crazy. Because yeah. that one's a little... 
that one's a little outside the box for me. That one was more, um, that one was a little more synthesized. I don't know if there's, it, that was all keyboard, I think. You know, there's like this really industrial sounding drum thing. Then there's a, then there's like a pulse beat thing. It's almost like, sounds like a dance song. Then there's this uh, synthesizer thing kind of doing a, that might've been a guitar. I don't remember. There might've been both a, an electric guitar and a synthesizer in there. Um, but, uh, and then, oh, okay, that song was really fun to record. The, I, I discovered something that I'd never known about my, this editing software is expansive. Like, I still find new stuff in it all the time. There's so many functions and so many things to do in it. But um, the, when I was recording that song, uh, I discovered this thing where I, it like looped. So where you could record for one measure of time and then it would cut off the recording. So you'd have this, this block of the recording. Then in the space, the next row beneath it, it would start recording again with the other thing playing. And then it would keep doing it, it would keep looping. And so using that, I was able to simulate the sound of like a chorus of people singing one body, one mind over and over and over again by just slightly altering my voice. Like I did like a nasal thing. I did like shouting off in different directions. I did high pitch like, oh, okay, okay, you know what? Let me, let me stop you real quick because today when I was listening through your entire album, there was a part where a woman's voice came in. Mm -hmm. who, who was that? That's my mom. That was very. That I was, was very, like, I was like, I gotta ask him about who is that. That was that was very spontaneous. Um, I had the lyric and I was gonna say it, uh, or I was gonna. I thought about like seeing if I could find maybe one of my friends, but I know like I have a few acquaintances in the industry. I was gonna like ask some actor person maybe if they would want to record a line for it, but also was like that's kind of weird. I don't know. Um, I thought about like maybe paying someone to do it, but then uh, my mom like came downstairs for whatever reason while I was recording, <laughs> and I asked her to Daniel, listen. Daniel, it's time to for it. dinner. <laughs> yeah, uh, actually, no, it was probably more like Daniel. Why the hell are you still awake? It's like three o'clock in the morning, <laughs> and she just finished whatever show she was watching. You're like, why are you like... awake? Three a.m. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, she she came downstairs, and I was like. You want you want to help with something really quick, um, and she just said it. She said it like five different ways, and I ended up using the first take. I think like we did one take where she was very like monotone kind of, and then every other time there was more inflection on her voice. But then listening to it back, it worked better. Just being the, the kind of just you have been here before thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, I loved it. It was great. And then put a bunch of reverb on it and. EQ it and it just sounds almost ghostly and, eth yeah. and ethereal and weird and it, it plants this it, it, the way that lyric works within the rest of the context of the album is like the apocalypse is happening but it's happened before Ooh, you know um, <laughs> <laughs> you you have been here before the matrix it's all it's all everything's a lie <laughs> Uh, yeah, anyway, um, <laughs> this is a fun song. That was fun to make. Uh, the The whole thing was cool. Also, the, the vocal delivery was fun, too, because I was, like, trying to channel both um, David and... I don't remember the name of the guy, the lead singer from the band Cake. I was trying to do a little bit of that, too. Kind oh, of his, yeah. like, you know what? You know what's funny? I wonder if that's the same track, because in... One of your tracks again today, I was listening to the entire album, I was like, this is totally cake. Oh. So I'm yeah. going to have to go back. The dawn of new millennia, rising from the ashes, and you will be investing in all of our wares. My lifestyle is yours, your lifestyle is mine, in everything I see, one body and one mind. I was like, that's totally a cake. And this <laughs> totally sounds like cake. <laughs> Yeah, it, that that was that was yeah. It's probably the same song. That was yeah. also intentional, uh, and it, it it wasn't originally like that. I was just like messing around, and I did a take where I was kind of doing this sarcastic, and a little bit like what? How does you know the way Cake does it? Uh, oh, can you afford your rock and roll life? Yeah, so it's kind of that style. It's kind of that style, and it 
it worked very well and I loved it. Yeah. Um, I, I can't imagine playing it live, but like if I did and if I had like a band, you yeah, know, yeah. so where I didn't have to like have, be encumbered by like an instrument at the time. So for that song, there's a band playing the song and I can like go up to the crowd and be like, you will be investing in all of our way. You know, it would be it'd be fun. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm excited to see how far I can go with this um, music stuff. You know, like it's very fun. I really enjoy doing it. The amount of support that it has gained so far has absolutely been blowing my mind. Um, and like, uh, I thought that the decision to keep my stuff currently exclusive to like Bandcamp and YouTube would would end up being like detrimental and kind of risky. But so far, it's paid off and worked, you know. Um, and uh, the fact that I'm starting to like get gigs is incredible. Uh, I still think I have a lot to improve on, a lot to learn, you know, especially about playing live music, but. Um, I'm excited to go on the go on the journey and we'll see we'll see how far it goes. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Anyway. Well, when I first uh I think messaged you on Discord a, a while ago, it was yeah. I, I think it was your first album. And and I was I remember listening to the album and I remember thinking I would love to know what his what your process is. <laughs> because there is there are certain things uh in your writing that i think wow where did that come from like where where did that start what was that what was that context and even in this album as well so we can start from there and just say uh how do you go through your process oh boy that's a uh... That's an interesting, yeah. So, hmm. I guess the first thing to say is that there's there's no one single process. I know that there are there's there's been times where I've sat down with the intention to write a song, you know, without any previous ideas or whatever. I'll I'll be I'll be like, all right, I'm, I'm especially if I'm making an album, you know, like if I'm have the intention to complete a record and I have. Uh, normally, I can I like outline stuff beforehand. Like I get an idea of what I want the themes of everything to be, um, what uh, concepts and stuff I want to explore with the songs and how everything ties together. Because I'm very, I'm I'm very into uh, uh, concept stuff. I love I love it when I'm listening to an album of music and it rewards me for paying attention and like the desire to go deeper will always be like satisfied by it you know like uh, i don't know pink floyd's a you know off the cuff example of a band where like you listen to an album and there's so many layers to the album everything flows together all the stuff you know fits into the same thematic idea um and uh yeah stuff like that inspires me so much um so yeah when i go to record stuff normally i'm trying to record for an album and everything needs to fit into the context of the album uh that's not always the case uh, lightning in a bottle with the exception of that second half just the first half of just the acoustic bit that was done separately uh that was just an idea and that's the other that's the other process i was going to mention is sometimes and this has happened more and more as i've gotten more in tune with looking at the world through the lens of finding finding uh further meaning looking deeper and almost making things more dramatic or melodramatic you know uh as as time has gone on and as i've almost trained my art art for lack of a better word you know this can sound pretentious as hell but <laughs> for, as, I've, as i've trained my artistic third eye i've uh, had more and more moments where an idea or a, a phrase or whatever just pops into my head or something happens or I see something happen and I think about it a certain way and connect like some dots together about the way people seem to communicate around something or the way an event seems to play out or whatever, you know, it could be anything. Um, and that sets a spark that starts a fire and then you have to 
Okay, so let let me stop you real quick because that could be almost a complete fabrication where you could yes. write it where you could write a song that has no semblance to reality at all or uh. <laughs> right or you could actually be writing from some place within your own experience of existential crisis where you're actually like grieving or celebrating or contemplating so that's an interesting di- so that's part of where my question was okay is he writing as an imaginative artist right now or is he writing out of angst of 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 love of forlorn of of being torn you know so even in even in your your current album um how do you put it uh you know are we're, we're we're driving to the edge are we moving too fast like is that just a commonplace teenage you know like you know everybody feels this way i'm just gonna say this or was that oh no (laughs) right that 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 was so that song um yeah that song has changed a lot over time it originally had another verse and the kind of weird section where there's just like yelling and talking or whatever that wasn't there originally um the more dissonant chord was was in the original version but it was like less i think uh, it wasn't as prominent um but yeah I, I actually wrote that song for my uh girlfriend at the time when we were together uh because we were talking about songwriting and just like i was telling her about some of the stuff i was working on yeah i just i i wanted to uh write a song for her and i did and that that was it at the time i kind of had this self-fulfilling prophecy almost of this is going too fast you know like i kind of see where this is going (laughs) this is not gonna turn out great because it's going to be very difficult to communicate when there's such a um what's the best way to put this there's such a difference i guess in expectations for what the individual people were looking for. So obviously it just wasn't the right thing at the, at the the right time, you know? Yeah. At the, at the end of the day, the song is about, you know, we're moving too fast and, uh, we need to slow down. But at the same time, this is like fun and where it's exciting. And this, this is like, this seems like a new thing. Right. Um, but, uh, yeah. Like I said, there was a a whole verse, like a long verse that ended up getting cut out and replaced with the weird dissonant sounding stuff with just me saying, I don't know what I want thing. (laughs) Did you, did you feel like that dissonance that you inserted was a, um, an auditory representation of what the verse was that you cut out? Uh, yeah, kind of. Yeah. That's, that was the yes wow good job <laughs> that's the, that was the exact kind of intent and instead of saying all of the very specific and almost oversharing lyrics that were there originally i just kind of summed them up with uh i'm afraid this this isn't gonna work you know it's like what are some ideas that you're working through um well, uh, originally I had a idea for a trio of albums um, that all kind of went together that were about, they're really about me, but they're a slightly exaggerated thing, you know, like they're, they're about this character almost um, that I was originally going to make a web series about and uh, only ever made one episode. I, I still intend to do more. I still have scripts for more, but I've never... I just haven't had time or resources to do it the way I want to do it. Yet. Is this video or or music? This is music. This third or the uh, the web series was was video, but um the the first album was Mania Machinations. The second one was Paper Skies. This the sighting was a bit of a detour. Um, the next one, I actually don't remember what the next. The next one has a working title, which I guess I won't even re- reveal right now. But um yeah, I've got a. Uh, Got let me is it right over here? 
this this book, which you might have seen in some of the videos for um, the sighting uh, and in some of the imagery, the pictures, all of my notes for this next album are in here. Uh, and I've recorded like four or five songs for this already. And those were recorded at Diamond Studios. And I kind of want to record the whole thing there. So I'm just waiting till I have the resources and ability to go back because you know they are they are very affordable for a for a music studio but it's still very affordable is still kind of outside <laughs> my uh my range uh you know we'll 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 see if i can't fix that eventually but currently. so so let's go back to your first your second album and yeah. then you said that uh, the sighting was a bit of a hiatus so to speak so were the first sure. were the first two a part of the trilogy that you're talking yes. about? Okay. Yes. Yes, sir. What's because I'm I'm not I haven't thought about it in this way. What is the theme that's that what's the thread for those first two albums that would then lead to a third? Um so the first album is <laughs> All right. the The first album is kind of setting the scene and setting up. A, I'm thinking of it in the in an Act One, Act Two, Act Three type of way of looking at it. Um, the first thing sets up a lot of stuff, um, and like I said, a lot of this this project is very much a, a a vain project. Like again, it's a character, but it's it's pretty much just me. You know, like uh, most of the lyrics are very personal. A lot of the things I'm describing or talking about are real or at least the metaphors I'm using are to, you know, are metaphorical for real things that happened. Um, and uh, the first album, you know, you have, you have a person who's being, uh, who's trying to work through their own issues using art as almost a form of therapy. Uh, that that was the majority of the theme of the first album. The second one was a little bit more expansive in that oh yeah, and at the end of the first album he comes to this like he comes to an epiphany. Like at the very end, the last track, which is like fourteen minutes long, it's this big crazy thing where he kind of breaks past all of this old stuff where we're putting all this stuff down on paper and purging it, getting rid of it and moving past it and moving on to greater things. You know, any issues with different aspects of life or whatever is out. Um, we're going to almost, uh, we're, we're going to kind of set a blueprint out for the future. We're going to talk about how art affects us in different ways. You know, like a song like Go to Bed is very much about the, um, the artistic process, I guess. My head is on fire, and I cannot sleep. I'm going to stay up all night and keep on writing. Yeah, exactly. Perfect. That's Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I remember when I first uploaded that video, and I still get comments from people telling me it's either telling me that it's that, where it's just like the, the clock, and then every other comment will be someone saying it's about acid. So <laughs> it's, uh, it's interesting to see how many... Um, people have different interpretations of that song where I think they, they said it was about writing a song in the middle of the night. So, you know, that's, I guess that's probably the correct one, but people can interpret it however they want. Um, mm -hmm. uh, the second album is a lot more expansive. It's kind of this, the second album is all about illusion. Really. It's about, I built this character and now I'm breaking them down almost at the, in the first half of the album is, um, uh, all fabrication pretty much. The first, most of the first half of it is this, is me thinking about what's a, what's the type of life that I wish I was able to lead at this point in my life. You know, like the song starts with the first songs, paper skies, you know, this, the, the main person's like, um, obviously there's still angst there and there's still like conflict that I'm adding to it, but the general, um, uh, framing of the conflict is the life that I wish I was able to lead, 
with a song like Samiramis being, all right, I'm getting in a car or a taxi or whatever. I'm heading from the hotel to the show. I'm going to play for five people tonight and I'm going to thank God that I have them. Eventually you will get sick of me, but thanks for coming out anyway. You know, and then closer to the end, it's like, I look at these like celebrity people, a sense of style is all you care about. Your inner thoughts are within, not without. I used to think you all were shallow, realized I'm just hollow. You know, this like kind of depressing epiphany type thing. But then near the end, I flip it and it's like, I'm going to, I'm going to kind of, because what I want to do with my life or, you know, right now, what I want to do with my life, what I want to do with my career, I guess, is I love independent music i love art i love artists it's such a incredibly powerful form of communication it, and such an interesting form of communication uh is media i guess um and you know when i meet these passionate ambitious people who just don't have like the resources that some big bigger name people have like when I see these people with all this talent and all these ideas and all this ambition, and then you see that the show that's on TV with a bunch of views is freaking the Kardashians or something. It's like, yeah, long live the, the indie scene, you know, long, <laughs> long live uh, punk ideology, long live progressive ideology, long live experimental ideology. You know, that's, that's amazing. That's awesome. And I want to involve myself in it. I want to help other people and I want to kind of rise, you know, we're all going to rise together. So at the end, it's if we ever make it to the stars, we're going to tear them down. Art's no longer art. It's manufactured and isolated. Um, yeah, it's, uh, so what is, um, <laughs> what is art? What is truth? So one of the things that I, tend to rail against myself and i remember struggling through this back in the 90s when postmodernism was kind of a buzzword where you could completely almost disassociate the author's writing and interpret it your own way i always had a problem with that i always thought that that wasn't true to truth that is, you, mm -hmm. Daniel, if, if you write a song, that song comes from a certain place that you're trying to express either your experience, your thoughts, your process. And then for someone else to come along and say, you know, it's almost like looking at a, a, a portrait or a painting and noticing the, the colors. And someone, sure. else, and someone else is looking at it and, and they're noticing the um the perspective right so there's perspective and then there's colors but the artist was doing both you know so how how do you think the relationship should be handled by those who interpret what you put out interpret what you didn't intend um that's a very good question that has uh that's almost almost beyond me has it has multiple in my opinion it has multiple different answers depending on the context really um there's no one perfect solution i don't think and i think any answer i give will eventually lead to some form of hypocrisy but i'm gonna i'm gonna try anyway um um i I personally don't have a huge problem with people interpreting things their own way, especially when like, hmm, let me, let me try to think of an example. Um, like, let's say an artist writes a song about their apparent passing away. And for them, it was their, their father passing away. That's what they wrote. They wrote a song. That was a very emotionally impactful song, very personal song about their, their dad uh, dying. And then uh, someone else hears that song and they listen to it and they hear the words and they interpret it or they relate it to their own um, best friend 
passing away. It's not their dad. It's, it's some other person or some other form of loss that they've had in their life. I don't see any problem with that. And I think that that's actually one of the beautiful things about art is that it can mean different things to different people and even grow beyond what the original artist intended. At the same time, I think it's important to know what the artist intended, you know? Like maybe you have a different opinion or perspective on it, but the artist is the one who like made the thing. Um, so like, uh, <laughs> man, I, I think of multiple examples, but they're all like uh, mildly political. Oh, let me think. What's a like? Didn't doesn't Bruce Springsteen have a song that's like critical of the of the U.S. But then like a bunch of there are people who like take it to be yeah yeah a born patriotic in the, born song. In the USA. Sure. Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. Let me let me phrase it like that. All right. So there's then there's some people who take it to be like a very patriotic song, even though it's not really intended to be that way. When art goes, when art does that, it's a little weirder. You know, it's yeah, it's a yeah. slightly stranger ground to go on. Yeah. You know, uh, that's when the being able to interpret it however you want kind of has consequences. And um, yeah. So again, I. And that's one example. There's other ones that are like time is a great example of a song where like I I understand the song, you know, like I, I understand the point that it's getting across, but I'm not like at a point yet where I like I know that in twenty years that song will be more impactful to me. Right. You know? Like yeah. no matter what I do, even if I uh achieved everything I could possibly want to achieve. What's the poem? The road not taken, or yeah, just the Robert the Frost. just the just the concept of how like regret works. Like no matter what you do, you will wish you'd kind of you will wonder what would have happened if you'd done the other thing or something different. You know, um, time captures that feeling of slipping away. The moments that make up a dull day, fritter and waste your hours in an offhand way, and, and then and then what? Uh, lying in the sunshine staying home to watch the rain uh you are you are young and t uh, time is long there's time to kill today and then one day you find 10 years have got behind you no one showed you when to run you missed the starting gun Man, yeah yeah that, that, so that, that line <laughs> that line was just crazy amazing which is again so there's 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 an aspect in which that's where my initial impetus was the catalyst for me to ask you like where because as a 50 year old i listen to some of the the songs that you make that talk about where you're at asking the questions and i think how can this kid be asking these questions like what has he experienced and then <laughs> so when you think about even uh dark side of the moon and and pink floyd these guys were in their late 20s maybe that's true. Yeah, yeah. And they, at the same they were time, young, I'm thinking, man, these guys were only in their late, and, but yet they write such a prolifically, just the, like one of the most profound, existential, you know, just just massive. It's just deep. It's crazy. And then, the dark side of the moon is insane. It's it's amazing. You know what? What's interesting, Daniel, is I've I've got a 17 year old son. And I bought the album for him two years ago, and he still hasn't listened to it. So I'm just waiting, right? It's it's going to be all syncopatic. It's going to be just all synchronicity. He's going to yeah. listen. He's going to listen to it at the right time, and he's going to think, "Wow, I don't know, I don't know." But um, yeah, and then uh, the great gig in the sky. The Great Gig in the Sky has absolutely no lyrics. And it's, got, it's got the it's got the guy talking yeah, for like the, two yeah, seconds, the, but yeah, then yeah. the the vocalization on that song. Yeah. Oh my god, it's so raw and, and like they they were originally gonna put lyrics in that. Yeah. Part. Like she was originally gonna have lyrics, but then they like did right. a take where she's just like, what I don't even know what that's called, ad libbing. I don't, I don't know. Scat, scat. It's not scatting. Just improvising. improvising just yeah. say it was. It's amazing absolutely amazing yeah 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 well yeah so um i think we can probably just kind of wrap this up right now i i really just wanted to touch base with you again and uh and follow up with our previous interview um i've enjoyed everything 
that you've been expressing, um, not all of it resonates with me, but a lot of it does. And, you know, I think I try to put out uh, as many positive comments as I can with things that you put out. Um, and the one thing that I do appreciate is, is your vulnerability in terms of just simply expressing who you are and, and making it public for others to find a connection. And I think that's what draws me to all of my favorite artists. Like that's all what, like, even if I don't agree with like anything that they're saying, when they are very obviously writing from a place of, um, how do I put this? When they are very obviously writing from the heart, from since from a place of sincerity, you know, that, that always resonates with me right. almost no matter what it is. Yeah. And so when I go to write music, that's what I want to, to be. I'm so glad that you said that. Cause that's like, that's, that's what I'm going for, man. You know, like I've um, now been trying to engage with the community of people who are making music right now. Like people who have 10 monthly listeners on Spotify or people who have a hundred subscribers on YouTube or whatever, and are trying to make music. And one thing that I see a lot is people making stuff that sounds really, really like pretty or like almost perfect sounding, you know, probably using a keyboard or a synthesizer or like even, uh, you know, there's, there's lots of sites now or places where you can just like buy uh, tracks and then like make, just put lyrics on top of them or whatever. So I've, I've seen some people do that and they're, a lot of the a lot of the time the lyrics or the style of thing that they're doing is very very vague um and i find that ugliness or rawness or vulnerability is way more impactful so when i go to make something i don't really care if it sounds perfect or not you know it can sound ugly or raw or um, like it was recorded in a basement because, you know, it was. Uh, but as long as I'm able to convey something or put some form of emotional content into what I'm doing, then for me it was worth it. And then anytime I play it live, I connect with it. And then I think that people, or at least people who are like me, will appreciate it, you know? And that's, that's all I can hope for. Um, but anyway, thank you so much for having me yeah, back. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I'm so thankful that I was in a place, um, you know, as a truck driver over the road all week long, when the weekend comes, a lot of times I'm just like, uh, sure. I do yeah. not want to do anything. So I got back today and uh, just had the vibe. And uh, I think it was maybe two weeks ago, I contacted you and said, Hey, are you around? So I had the muse at that moment, but you weren't around today. You were, yeah. so it all worked out. So, Daniel Perfetta, thanks so much for being another part of an exciting adventure here on Red Hand Radio where we uh, talk about uh, content with their creators. And, yeah, I'm, I'm really glad we got to talk again. Yeah, you know? me too. Like, I, uh, I really enjoyed our last conversation. Now it's been almost two years, and uh, it's, uh, it's great talking with you again. You too, Daniel. You too. All right. So what I'll do is uh, when I'm when I'm able to, I'll uh, go back. I'll probably cut out all. Of Thanks so much for tuning into this exciting adventure of Red Hen Radio. I hope you enjoyed that interview with Daniel Perfetto. What he's going to do right now is react to a song that I recommended out of a number of songs I gave him to choose from. As always, when I uh, close these interviews with my content creators if they do reactions i ask them to react to something that i suggest and so here is daniel's reaction to pearl charles slipping away please make sure that you subscribe like share and uh hit the bell notification for daniel's channels do that as well for me i appreciate it thanks so much for tuning in until next time Hey everybody, welcome back. Today we're going to be reacting to a Pearl Charles song called Slipping Away off an album that actually was released just last year and um, is classified as soft rock or uh, alternative pop music. Um, 
psychedelic country music. There were some interesting tags when I looked uh, this artist up. And um, yeah, this is their sophomore album. They've only released two records so far. And um, yeah, I'd never heard of them, and I'm excited to, uh, to get acquainted. Let's do this. Slipping Away 3. Right off the bat, the, the name makes me think of Slip Sliding Away, which I think is by Paul Simon. But uh, anyways, here we go. Three, two, one. In this way for weeks and weeks, why does it feel like he? Changing with perspective There's never been a line Between the past and the present Watch it slipping away There it goes Things that we used to say Don't make sense anymore Don't make sense anymore Watch it slipping Her voice. A picture stirred and the guitar tone is really cool too. Words I heard inside a painting. Looking back, you trace the path to your final destination. There was nothing we could do. Can't block the path of least resistance. Only songs are left as proof. What a great line. Watch it slipping away. There it goes. Things that we used to say don't make sense anymore. Don't make sense anymore. Watch it slipping away. There it goes. Things that we used to say don't make sense anymore. come back to the album but for for now let's 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 just focus on the song that we uh that we just heard um okay so slipping away by pearl charles love the uh chorus love the verses especially near the end there were some song uh, lyrics that really hit home for me um the general sound of everything was really pretty a little bit of a retro feel to it like i wouldn't i wouldn't be shocked if you told me this came out in like the 70s you know maybe it's a little bit like cleaner uh maybe but the vocal style the way the guitar sounded you know could have been in like a 
a Led Zeppelin thing, you know? There's there's a, a lot of uh, throwbacks, I guess you could say. Um, I like it a lot. All right, it's been this way for weeks and weeks. Why does it feel like years? It's a great opening line. So it's been this way for weeks, but it feels like absolutely forever. We know we live, we know we die, but we don't know why we're here. Horizons in my mind. So throughout the song while I was listening to it, I thought that it was, I kind of went back and forth on whether it felt like it was more of a, of a relationship song or more of a kind of looking at the universe song. And now I think it's kind of both. Um, so that first bit, then this way for weeks and years, why does it feel, then this way for weeks and weeks, why does it feel like years? We know we live, we know we die, but we don't know why we're here. Horizons in my mind are changing with perspective. There's never been a line between the past and the present. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah, it's all collective. Watch it slipping away. There it goes. Things that we used to say don't make sense anymore. Watch it slipping away. There it goes. Things that we used to say don't make sense anymore. Does she say bury a ghost at any point? Or is it there it goes every time and I just thought it was bury a ghost? I thought it was bury a ghost. Wait, 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 wait. Listen, listen. Watch it slipping away. There it goes. Things oh, it is there it goes. What the hell? I liked Bury It Ghost. That was one of my favorite. All right. Okay. So the chorus is okay. That was like my favorite part of, the, of my made up chorus that I have in my head, apparently. Anyways. Okay. Um, the chorus is great, though. I'm, I'm kidding. A picture's worth a thousand words I heard inside a painting. Looking back, you trace the path till you find your destination. There was nothing we could do. Can't walk the path of least resistance. Only songs are left as proof of our unfulfilled existence. Um, spend all your time forgetting that you were even there. Spend all your time pretending that you never even came. I thought she said that you never even cared. Maybe this lyric thing on Genius is just incorrect. Which which could happen, you know. They're, they're, uh, I now know firsthand how Genius.com uh, gets their how it works and how they get their contributions because I've done it myself and um, yeah it's contribute it's it's like user edited so you know it, unless there was like a lyric sheet that came with the album because uh, I saw this album is actually on Bandcamp um, to go support the artist actually if you if you enjoyed the song go check out the rest of it but uh, uh, yeah uh, if there are no lyrics then some people might have just interpreted it or misheard or I'm mishearing I don't know okay so to me this song it does feel about the death of a relationship and moving past it and like uh, things that we used to say don't make sense anymore. Um, the person that I am is not the person who I once was. Even though the past and the present, there is no line between them. It's all one and the same. Uh, everything is compounding. Everything's layered and, and constantly building layers upon layers, kind of like a tree as it, as it grows outward and gets new, uh, new rings in the bark. Um, and, uh, yeah, the song is really beautiful. Like, it has this almost cosmic sentiment, even though it feels a bit like a breakup song. Uh, lyrics like, let me look at them one more time. I really do like this specific line right here. A picture is worth a thousand words that I heard inside of a painting. <laughs> Looking back, you trace the path until you find your destination. So she's she's searching for answers in the past, which is funny since I feel like the music feels like uh, a throwback a little bit. There was nothing we could do. Can't walk the path of the path of least resistance. Okay, so we couldn't make it easy on ourselves, and only songs are left as proof of our unfulfilled existence. And that feels like it's on a much wider cosmic level. Uh, talking about the universe almost we don't know why we're here we don't know what we're doing here um yeah we know we live we know we die but we don't know why we're here yeah and we're spending our time trying to forget spending all your time forgetting that you were even there spending all your time pretending that you never even cared it's a good song wow Alrighty then, um, that was Slipping Away by Pearl Charles. Again, you should check out the artists if you have never heard of them. Um, and a uh, huge thank you to Redhead Radio for uh, having me on the show again and for being so patient with me as I made them wait 
like more than a month for me to finally sit down and record this video. Um, I greatly appreciate the recommendation and I hope you and everyone watching this are having a great day. See you soon. Uh, yours truly, Daniel Profeta, out.